So, without further ado, will you please help me welcome beside Eric Reiter. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start off by thanking the organizers of this wonderful event for having me. Thank you to um, everybody who worked so hard to put together an event like this. I can tell you, having organized certainly nothing of this size myself, but having organized conferences and various events, it takes a lot of work. Um, I think we should first probably give a hand to the people who have done that hard work. So. I guess they, they sort of told me when I came up here that I should probably try to introduce myself first, but I mean, I think everything was pretty much said. I'm not sure what else I need to say. Um, I do this work independently. What that means, I mean, and that's important to me, and I kind of stress the word independent when I'm you know, asked to speak or uh, to provide a description, because what that means is nobody pays me. So because nobody pays me, nobody gets to tell me what to say. Nobody gets to say. Nobody gets to say, well, this subject is off limits, this subject you shouldn't talk about, or maybe you should focus on this or that. That is part of how the system works. And if you're part of that system, unfortunately, you're forced to play that game. And so when I say that I'm independent, what I really mean is that when you're hearing me say something, that's what I think, and that's what I mean, and there is no double game in my language. So, talking about Eritrea and talking about the issues that, that I focus on, I, um, I often use the term anti-imperialism. And anti-imperialism, I think, is a description of the ideology. It's certainly not something I came up with. There's a long history of that term. Um, but I think it bears a little bit closer analysis what exactly that means. And in order to do that, you have to define what imperialism means. To say you're against something, let's, let's be clear about what that something is. And what that something is, is not what the media tells you that it is. It's not what the corporate media, the mainstream media, or even the pseudo-alternative foundation-funded human rights media, or what have you, tells you that it is. They'll try to tell you that there are multiple empires in this world and that they're all competing with each other. But this is false. I think that anybody who puts time and effort into this sort of analysis can understand that really there is one global empire, one globalized empire. It has bases in Washington, on Wall Street, in London, in Paris, in many parts of the world, in Saudi Arabia, in Israel, in many places. And this global empire we could call an empire of finance capital, of neoliberal capitalism, whatever you want to say. There are many terms to describe what it is. But this empire, I think, needs to be understood as something that is not operating in the way that empires necessarily historically have. That is to say, it controls or significantly influences many, many, many organizations, myriad organizations, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, Continental Development Banks, major transnational global corporations, all are part of one system, one system with many complex interlocking parts. And these parts don't always speak to each other. They don't always work together. Oftentimes they're at cross interests, but ultimately it is one cohesive system. And I think that part of what we need to understand about this system is how it operates in what we would call the Global South. And what they would like to do, and part of where Eritrea fits into this question, is basically controlling and dictating and influencing the course of development. They want to tell you how you're supposed to develop yourself. You don't get the right to develop in however your own country sees fit. You have to develop according to their rules, according to their practices. And that is 21st century imperialism. In other words, what the empire wants to do is it wants to maintain and expand 
It's global hegemony, or in another phrase, perhaps global domination. That's what empire is about. And this is really an extension of a system that's been around for many centuries, isn't it? I mean, in a sense, what we're really talking about, I think, is the logical product of, on the one hand, colonialism, which anybody who knows anything about African history understands perfectly well, and capitalism. And it is the marriage of colonialism and capitalism. And that's how 21st century imperialism operates. We could even call it neo-colonial capitalism. But the question is, what are the tools of this empire, of this imperial system? How does it operate? So I know that I'm a bit limited on time here, so I can't really go into all of these specifics, because honestly, you need to spend at least a semester or a year in a course to really go into that. But let me just break it down into a couple of categories. Let's begin first with political tools that it uses. Institutions, such as the United Nations, the International Criminal Court, the European Union, the G7, many other institutions that are dominated by this system with its ruling establishment. There are regional political institutions as well in which the empire really has massive influence. The Organization of American States in Latin America, ASEAN in Asia, even to a large extent the African Union. So what you're seeing then is that it uses these various international institutions and it uses compliant governments. Governments that it can make into proxies, into puppets. Of course, I think the Eritrean community understands perfectly the puppet government nature of Ethiopia, of the role that Ethiopia has played, of the role that Ethiopia has played for imperialism, certainly in the last 25, 30, 40 years. So aside from political tools, there's economic tools that you need to be clear about on how they operate. The International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, these institutions operate in the interests of this global system. Private banks, which are indeed also globalized, you know, HSBC, Barclays, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, we all know many, many of these uh, banks and other corporations, and they use one of their principal weapons is debt. And the issuance and maintenance of debt forces these countries into a never-ending cycle of debt service, debt servitude, debt slavery, we could say. You never get out of that cycle. Once you take on the loan, you then have to take new loans to pay back the original loan and new loans on top of that, and you're in this endless cycle that so many African countries have found themselves in. <coughs> Sanctions. Economic warfare is really what sanctions should be called, because that's what it is. And when a country is sanctioned, it's not simply to tell that country what to do. It's to demonstrate to that country the price that it has to pay to be independent. And I think this is also something Eritrea has dealt with significantly. So we have political and economic tools. There's also military tools. The militaries of the neo-colonial powers, the US, the UK, France, they also have their subgroupings, AFRICOM and the like. Internationalized military structures such as NATO and its many partnerships and sub-partnership projects. Anybody who knows the destruction and savagery that was wrought on Libya understands perfectly the role of NATO. You have an I'm, you know, I, I unfortunately, I'm not going to refer to some of the comments that were made with the previous presentations, but you have these NGOs, so-called human rights organizations, who work in the interests of these very same institutions, who basically operate as a weapon of this same system. Now, this is not to say that everything that they do is false. Not everything they say is a lie. But everything comes with an agenda, with a political agenda. And if they go against the interests of that agenda, they cease to exist. And there are many examples of that. So when they come and tell you, well, this organization says that human rights is A, B, and C, what they're really saying is, you better do X, Y, and Z, or else you'll pay the price. <laughs> and 
And then you also have the foundation funded, what I would call pseudo alternative media. And these operate in an interesting way because they present themselves as outside of the mainstream. And yet, interestingly, on some of the most difficult topics, they somehow are always on the same side as imperialism. So if you look at the war in Libya, for example, you had a lot of these so-called left progressive news outlets, media outlets, which presented themselves as interested in development, interested in the struggle for independence, and, and yet they essentially mirror the same narrative that CNN and Fox and all of the rest of them were saying. And the reason is because they come out of that very same system. So those same institutions, those same individuals that fund these so-called human rights organizations also fund many, many media outlets. Finally, you have cultural weapons that are used, and this is also really important. They like to talk a lot about so-called values. They want to tell you your values. And they want to say that there are these universal values, and if you have a different opinion, a different perspective based in your own culture, derived from your own history, they like to tell you you're wrong. You don't have a right to see it differently, to see your own progress differently. They also use what I would call cultural exports, entertainment, sports, fashion. All of these things are perfectly fine in and of themselves, but notice the way that they're used what objective they ultimately have. And you'll see that in fact they are part of that very same system. Now, I don't want to go into an endless dissection of all of these individual little things. I just want to say why I'm outlining all of this to begin with. And that is mainly because I think it is important to understand the complexity of these institutions and these forces that to a large extent are arrayed against Eritrea. This is a global system that sees in Eritrea a threat. A threat for a number of reasons, because a country that won independence for itself on the battlefield with lives, with blood, and paid a tremendous price for that, has decided to develop itself without listening to anybody else, doing it on its own, doing it its own way. And the point of this is, it frightens them. They don't like countries that will do what they believe is best, rather than doing what they're told. But the challenges that Eritrea faces as a result of the many years of war, as a result of sanctions, as a result of all of these vast weapons that the imperial system has arrayed against it, Things like food security, agricultural development, health care, access to vaccines, preventative treatment, HIV AIDS reduction, infrastructure development, education, all of these things, you'll never hear them talked about as quote unquote human rights. Even though, aren't those the fundamental human rights? And isn't that what Eritrea is building? So you'll have people who will come on the stage who will come and speak to you and they'll tell you, well, things are good and, and improving in Eritrea, but how come human rights is such a problem? And I would respond, you mean the Millennium Development Goals that Eritrea has achieved? <laughs> you mean access to clean drinking water, to food security, to agricultural development, to infrastructure development into all of these things, do those not also count as human rights? This is a fundamental question that needs to be posed to this entire so-called nonprofit, so-called human rights complex. Ask them that, and they don't have an answer for you, because their conception of human rights is human rights as they dictate them to you, not as you believe them to be. And that's the important point about this. But again, the question is, so what? What's the big deal? Eritrea is not a terribly large country. You heard people on this very stage saying, well, it's not so strategically important. They don't care so much about Eritrea. But the question is, so then why do they care so much? Why do they want to destroy the country? Because the answer, I think, is quite clear. It's quite obvious. Because Eritrea presents a dangerous, good example. Yeah. 
So I, I want to point out, um, in 2007, there was a widely read article that came out in the, in the, excuse me, the Los Angeles Times, one of the biggest papers in the U.S. The headline read, Eritrea aspires to be self-reliant, rejecting foreign aid. Now, the article began with the following sentence. I'm quoting it directly. Quote, this struggling, low-profile nation is doing something virtually unheard of in Africa. It's turning down foreign aid. Close quote. Now, I want you to think just for a second what exactly is being said. That Eritrea is doing something, or this is, of course, eight years ago now, that Eritrea was doing something unheard of rejecting aid. In other words, Eritrea said, our national development is in our own hands and no one else's. And because they said that, they put a target on their back. Because they took away one of the most potent weapons that the imperial system has for controlling nations, and that is aid. Eritrea's president explained after rejecting a $200 million aid package from the World Bank, he said, quote, 50 years and billions of dollars in post-colonial international aid have done little to lift Africa from chronic poverty. African societies are crippled societies. You can't keep these people living on handouts because that doesn't change their lives. That's what he said. He said it's... Now, you have to understand that when you make a statement like that, you automatically make yourself into the enemy for this system. It's not very difficult to figure out why they hate Eritrea, why they make Eritrea into the vicious monster, quote unquote, North Korea of Africa or whatever. And don't get me started on that stupid <laughs> phrase. Because I'll talk to you about North Korea too, but that's a separate issue. Such independence that Eritrea shows is not exactly applauded by neo-colonial countries who use debt as a means of controlling nations that present themselves as independent. But are you independent when you're dependent on aid? You've seen all over the continent of Africa, literally from the beginning of the post-colonial period, that when you are dependent on aid, independence is a facade. It doesn't really exist. The great African revolutionary leader Thomas Sankara famously said, quote, imperialism is a system of exploitation that occurs not only in the brutal form of those who come with guns to conquer territory. Imperialism often occurs in more subtle forms, alone, food aid, blackmail, we are fighting this system that allows a handful of men on earth to rule all of humanity. And they murdered him. Thomas Sankara was removed and killed for precisely that sort of position. And this is the point, though, that Sankara so skillfully articulated. And this is what Eritrea has been doing, transforming itself into something of a national ideology of liberation in terms of development. And this is what they cannot allow. That 2007 article in the LA Times, they said, quote, the self-reliance program began a decade ago, but accelerated sharply in 2005. Relying on its meager budget and the conscription of about 800,000 of the country's citizens, the program so far has shown promising results. Now, this is eight years ago. We know what kind of results this program has shown up to today. And it's staggering. The article went on to say that these results are measured on a variety of UN health indicators, including life expectancy, immunizations, and malaria prevention. Eritrea scores as high and often higher than its neighbors, including Ethiopia and Kenya. It might be one of the most ambitious social and economic experiments underway in Africa. Now consider for a second if Eritrea, isolated, sanctioned, demonized, deprived of foreign investment to a large extent, made into the boogeyman of Africa, outperforms puppet governments in Ethiopia, 
and neighboring countries such as Kenya, with all of the aid and all of the corporations and all of the money, doesn't that tell you something about what Eritrea is achieving? 